Thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you for inviting me to this symposium uh, discussing old classic boats and for me, the media boats in particular. Uh, and this reminds me of all the nice events I've been through and all the very good friends I met through the years. My first visit to Finland was in 1950. In those days, there were popular event called the Inter-Scandinavian Junior Regatta. Uh, we were teams from the Royal Yacht Clubs of uh, Norway, KNS. From Denmark, it was a team from uh, KDY, a Royal Danish Yacht Club. And then us from Gothenburg, JKSS, uh, we had our team. The, likewise, uh, Stockholm, uh, Royal Swedish Yacht Club, KSSS was there. And then, of course, the host, uh, NJK, the Finnish Yacht Club. Uh, those uh, competitions uh, was every other year, so we circulated a little bit. And in uh, 1950, and that is 70 years ago, I met quite a few uh, friends that stayed friends forever then. But uh, we managed to win that together in 1950, so that was my last year as a junior. I was uh, then really well taken care of by the Talbert family. And there, of course, I met the brothers, uh, Peter and Henrik, Hekka, as we called him. And we uh, became very, very good friends, lifelong friends. And uh, we've been sailing after that quite a few times together. There was one instance, uh, we were preparing for the Olympics in 64. And we had a football match, I think it was in Kiel. Uh, and uh, it happened so that uh, Henrik broke his leg. So going to Tokyo there, uh, Henrik was mostly on crutches. And that was perhaps a little too bad or good for me because I managed to beat him for the bronze medal. Peter ended up uh, fourth, unluckily, that time. But uh, all the friends I've had over here, I think some of them are here now. There were Freddy Erström, Rolf Zachariasen, Thielen, Sundman, Hackman, and another Talberg, Andrews, and Gullikson, Yussi. So nice to see you here. Maybe there are some other people here who might have been around in those days. Uh, anyway, after that, in 1953, I had the pleasure of sailing a 5.5 meter. This was a boat, uh, in those days it was very popular with the boat lotteries. You know, the yacht clubs had their boats standing in the city center or somewhere to sell lots to be able to win a boat. And that year, 53, the boat was won by uh, the Commodore of the Gothenburg, Gothenburg Yacht Club, Don Axel Brustum. He was a shipping magnate. And uh, uh, he intended to have that boat uh, for young, promising sailors to uh, have something. Oh, uh, promising sailor to sail that boat. And I was chosen to take the boat up to Hanker, Norway, and participate in a big regatta there. And there, of course, there were uh, Crown Prince and Prince and the Royal Ship and nice receptions. And uh, on the race course, uh, I then saw beside all these 5.5 meters, there were the six meters, eight meters, and uh, the 12 meters. And I was really, really impressed by these 12 meters. What a giant ship they were to me, you know. We we're not used to that big uh, type of ships in those days. So the 
12 meters really caught, caught on. On board one of the 12 meters, uh, it was uh, owned by the American ambassador to Oslo. Charles U. Bay was his name. On foredeck, he had a good friend of mine called the uh, name of Leif Wikström, who uh, managed the foredeck and had control of most of the things. But, and this uh, Leif Wikström, he, a couple of years later, he was in Melbourne to win the gold medal in the Dragon class. So uh, uh, that was my first acquaintance with the meter boats, and uh, I guess we ended up in the middle of the field someplace. Then uh, next time was uh, 55. It was uh, KSSS Jubilee, 125th years Jubilee in Sandham. For me, the thing started out that I was to sail the Gotland Round with a 50-foot boat, a newly launched boat by a business friend of my father, K.J. Knudsen in Stockholm. And we managed uh, just barely to sail the boat from Dalaru down to Visby, where the start was. Uh, we had a compass on board. That was about the only navigational aid we had at that time. The, the boat was not equipped at all. But entering the harbor in Visby, the harbor master called, called us and asked for the name of the boat. The boat's name was Ondine. So he showed us a very nice spot in the harbor next to some bigger boats, uh, more, more prominent yachts there. So we, we uh, tied, tied on. A few years, a few uh, hours later, there was a bigger American boat approaching the harbor. Harbor master asked the, the name of the boat. It's Ondine, they said. And <laughs> was a bit of healing dealing there uh, to, to squeeze his boat in beside us. You know, we, we didn't have to move. We were lucky, understanding that we had stolen the place uh, for the American Ondine. That was a really super uh, ocean racer, had done the Atlantic uh, race and a lot of other things. Quite famous, owned by a a man named Huey Long. So we uh, started the race in Visby, sailing south uh, towards the southern tip of uh, Gotland, Hoburgen. And uh, while there, sometimes we tossed a little piece of paper in the front of the boat, you know, and time the, for the piece of paper to end up at the rear of the boat to, to clock that. And, judge the speed we had on the boat. So it was very primitive. Rounding uh, Hoburgen, we went north, had a very rough uh, night there, I remember, and the boat was swinging back and forth and the compass likewise. But uh, in the morning, there, was, there she was, uh, the light ship, uh, Svenska Björn, that we had to round. So, we, we, we were just lucky, I think, or we had uh, sort of compromised this swing here and there to just hit that uh, light, uh, light uh, ship and then into Sandham. And there, uh, looking at the result, we found out uh, that we had beaten on corrected time this American superboat, so that felt really nice. <laughs> Then uh, further on in the, the regatta, I sailed on the 5.5 meter together with uh, my neighbor, Ben Kirstian was his name, boat's name, Sasha. It was uh, over 50 5.5 sailing in that regatta. And uh, uh, we, we managed to win that regatta, which, was, which felt really good. Uh, that was 55. Later that summer, I took the Swedish American liner Kungsholm to New York to fulfill my studies to become an industrial designer. 
And there uh, in September, I was called up on the phone by a, one of the sailing friends I met in Sandham, who asked me if I would like to come along and do a delivery sail from Marblehead, Massachusetts, down to City Island in New York. So we went up there, uh, stepped aboard this very nice looking boat, and it turned out to be a 12 meter. So there we went uh, south from Marblehead along the east coast of Massachusetts, past Boston, down towards uh, Cape Cod, through Cape Cod Canal. And there, as I heard later, on the port side, there was the home of the Kennedy family, uh, who used to live there during the summers. Then we turned west uh, into the large opening of Long Island Sound. And uh, we passed, uh, we unyoked, as some would say for sense, like we say in Sweden, we passed by a lighthouse, uh, the Brampton Reef. But passing there, some of the crew pointed toward the mainland north, uh, and there is Newport, he said. And on this water between Brampton Reef and the mainland, they used to sail for the America's Cup. But that was before the Second World War, and uh, then they used these huge, uh, magnificent J-class boats. I've seen some pictures of these uh, fantastic uh, sailboats, uh, Ranger, Enterprise, uh, whatever name they had, you know, but uh, I had read about it a little bit and uh, know something about it, what it was all about. And they also told me that uh, there are discussions going on in New York Yacht Club to resume this uh, races for the American Cup. And then, most probably, it will be in the 12 meter class, the type of boat we were just sailing along there. So that, that was uh, interesting to hear about. But after that, in the 60s, I didn't think much about the 12 meter or America Cup or anything like that. And for me, it was the star, star boat. It's a classic boat, it fits in well in this uh, uh, audience, I think. <laughs> it's over 100 years old, that model. And uh, of course, it's been modified a little bit here and there through the years. So I raised uh, a lot of. Uh, Star races in those days. It was Kiele uh, it was uh, district championship, national championship, European championship, world championship, you know, Olympics, and so on. I, I really spent a lot of time sailing in stars. But also, I spent really a lot of time redesigning the star boats to modify the lines between the tolerances, which were quite liberal at that time, to change the line as much as possible within the class rules. So uh, it was really, really for me, very interesting to do that work. And it, uh, the boats went better and better, and uh, I then managed to win the World Championship in the star class in San Diego in 1969. And that was sort of the mecca of sailing in those days. All the big names of the legends were sailing there, and uh, it was really something to win that world championship. Uh, they were all there in the north, Lord North, you know, Dennis Connor and uh, Pucken and Black Holder and yeah, you name them, they were all there. So uh, it was uh, quite a boost for me. And likewise, uh, in the Kiel Olympics in 72, the first uh, two boats were of uh, uh, my design, you know, the gold and silver medal winners were sailing boats that I designed. Uh, uh, unlucky for me, I was the losing one there. So an Australian guy that uh, came over to Sweden uh, to, to train with us uh, before the Olympics, and he found out that his boat was no good at all. 
So I helped him to, to get hold of one of the Europe stars, that they were called. And then uh, he managed to beat me with that. So <laughs> that <laughs> I was <laughs> not the best ending of that. Uh, see, what, what have I noticed after? Well, anyway, uh, these uh, uh, the performances I had had, and uh, I was thinking, uh, is there what the top in sailing? And the answer was uh, at the America's Cup. So I guess uh, my, my self confidence was really at its, its peak then. So. I managed uh, together with my uh, partners and very good friends, Stella Vesterdal and Lars Wickland, to start thinking about uh, a challenge for the American Cup. So we started working in 73, 74 to put something together, and we had enormous help by the, many of the big Swedish industrial companies and banks and so on to help us to raise the money to do this. So in 55, I went over to the New York Health Club and presented our challenge to the Commodore there. So then things were on. I, the same year, 55, I went to uh, Newport, uh, California, Newport uh, Beach, California, to meet the guy named Bill Ficker. He was an old uh, star world champion, so, uh, met before, and he was in charge of a boat, Columbia. She was sitting there at the dock, and uh, I looked through the boat and went through the inventories they had and so on. So we, we decided to buy that boat, Columbia. Uh, Bill Ficker, as a matter of fact, he, he was the uh, helmsman on board Columbia in 58 when they defended the cup. So the boat was shipped to Sweden, to Helsing, Helsingør. We put the mast up and started sailing the boat north towards Göteborg. Uh, we had a cut some, we were unlucky with the weather. It was blowing much too much for 12 meters. So the water came in all the time. We were uh, with buckets trying to get the boats dry to say it, but we had to give up outside Warberg, you know. We had to go in there one way or the other. Luckily, I've been to that harbor before. It's a lot of stone walls there that you have to cruise in between. A new engine on the boat, of course, and uh, well, we managed to uh, unhurt, uh, without hurting the boat, to get into the harbor and, you know, the first time you try to head up to wind, into the wind with a boat uh, over 20 tons heavy, it's a little hard to judge, you know, how far away from the stony walls you had to start this coming up. But luckily we managed so that the boat uh, wasn't hurt. But uh, that was quite an adventure. So we started training with that boat in um, Orsland and Kulavik at the same time as we, I was working on the, the design of the boat. Uh, I did a lot of research and I got hold of the measurement certificate, for instance, for a former winner of the cup uh, constellation that I studied carefully. Also, we made several test models uh, to be tested in the ship's testing tank in the Göteborg at Schalmers and found out uh, this and that. So uh, we decided to start to build the boat that was launched in, uh, in 1966 with the presence of uh, the king. Uh, the queen was there and she christened the boat for us uh, to Sverige. So then uh, we went on with the two boat training uh, until the spring when we had to ship the boats, the two boats over to Newport. Uh, so uh, in, uh, I think it was June 77, the two boats arrived in uh, Newport. Uh, in the meantime, I also uh, 
to test the shape of the boat and made a, I call it the hat model of a 12 meter, a six meter design that I worked on and uh, it just happened to be a World Cup race in Marstrand uh, in, in July, August that year. So I managed to win that World Championship and uh, then I yeah, felt good, you know, I thought I'm probably on the right track for the shape of the boat. So we went over there to uh, Newport. Um, we had a fantastic setup, an organization that was out of this world, you know. The way we, we lived, you know, it was a big mansion at the inlet to the, uh, uh, Newport, to harbor the city, the naval, the naval base they had in there. There was a lot of traffic in this little sound, you know. So we were living on one side. It was a house owned by Mrs. Hawkingcoss. She was the mother of Jackie Kennedy. So that was a house that uh, John and Jackie had lived in, in during the summer many times. So, you know, knowing that you occupied the bedroom where John and Jackie were sleeping and the desk, he had signed all these big uh, contracts or whatever important things he had to do, but uh, that felt good. On top of that, we had uh, two massive chefs, you know, uh, Leif Mannerström and uh, Christus Rantusson. They were our kitchen guys and doing the food, you know very well, so it was fantastic. We had a big lawn, you know, down to the water where we had our exercises and things, and uh, many days, you know, the, this big naval, big, big naval ships passed by there. So I guess our kids, we had our families with it. our kids or wives, they went down there to load the flag to say hello to these, uh, majestic uh, cruising ships uh, and they had to see a little guy sail, climbing up all the stairs to answer our greetings to them. That was, we had a lot of fun. And, and we had small boats traveling across the Sound because on the other side, Fort Wetherill, there was an old submarine base where we had our two boats with a nice workshop and sail off and all that. So, we had a fantastic setup there in Newport in 77. Then there came the racing and, uh, well, uh, we managed to beat the French uh, Baron Vic's boat, uh, France, uh, in the semifinals. So we were up against Australia in the Challengers final. Uh, it didn't go all that well. We were beaten, clearly. Uh, no excuse. <laughs> so uh, uh, that was that year. Then uh, uh, between 77 and 1980, I, I did a lot of match racing, you know, uh, often against all these other American, American Cup uh, involved sailors. I, I managed to win the Liberty Cup that was in New York. Uh, in 78 uh, against, you know, Ted Turner, Gary Jobson, uh, whatever I had. Also the British, uh, Harry Cudmore, for instance, uh, and other British uh, Cup sailors. So uh, that was a good thing too. In uh, 89, I went to Seattle for the six meter World Cup in Seattle, and uh, there was also these guys there, Ted Turner, Gary Jobson, Black Holler, Madden Burnham, and a lot of other American Cup sailors uh, sailing in Seattle. Uh, it was at one instant, you know, I was protested by Ted Turner. He claimed that we were sailing six meters the wrong way, you know, we were mini hiking, you know, like you do on the star or soling or so on, hiking outside the boat. This is a gentleman's boat, he said. You're not supposed to be inside the boat when you sail it. So then we did that, but 
anyway, we, we managed to win that world championship in Seattle. Uh, this made me feel good, you know. We made some improvements on uh, Sverige. And in 1980, uh, we came pretty close. We didn't have quite uh, that a nice setup to the organization. We couldn't get a hold of that uh, Hammersmith Forum again, so we had another paper. But it was okay. Uh, so we went uh, through some uh, uh, races in the beginning, and then we had uh, Australia again in the semifinals. And this was really close, you know. We had uh, two, two in the matches. We were beating them in the breezier wins, and they beat us in the light wins. So the deciding race, uh, it came out to be a light wind race. But we were so close uh, to beating him that, that it, it still doesn't feel quite right. But <laughs> they beat us, so we were out of it. We were out of it. But the Australians, you know, we know, we understood that we had to have a couple of uh, Mercury Cup campaigns to be able to learn the whole business. The Australian had done that, they had about four or five previous. So in 83, they finally managed to beat the Americans and win the America Cup. We tried very hard in 83 to be able to do still another America Cup challenge. Uh, it was, didn't quite work out. The world economy was going down at that time and a big shipping magnet uh, I had, Consafe was his company, it was very close to sign the check, but uh, we had to give up. So in, in uh, 83, I ended up being hired by the British uh, Syndicate Victory Challenge as uh, sparring helmsman to uh, help them with their training. And of course, I've said, a lot with these guys. Uh, it was Laurie Smith, uh, 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 Laurie Smith, Harry Cudmore, uh, other, there were other, other names I should remember, but we had trained so much together that they thought I could be a good sparring partner for them. So that was the point of the sailing I did in 83. And then in 87, I had a similar job for the, American, the Italian syndicate, Azzurra, where I should be a design consultant, they say, and a sparring shipper. And it, uh, it was a nice, nice time there in Fremantle. So, uh, but uh, we didn't really manage to get that boat much better with my help or despite my help, <laughs> I don't know. And so. It, it didn't work out, but I, I had a very good time there in uh, Fremantle. Uh, in uh, 87, let's see, that was in, yeah, that, that was 87, yeah. I also, um, there, there was another Swedish friend of mine, uh, Thomas Wallin, he wanted to do a, a Swedish challenge. <laughs> the next time, and uh, he wanted me to help him buy a good 12-meter boat for him to get a start with. So he bought from uh, Sir James, James Hardy a boat named Southern Australia, and uh, that boat he renamed to New Sweden or Tricluner, or he had some other names of it. But anyway, that boat uh, he brought to Europe, in uh, 88, it must have been, yeah, I sailed that boat. I was helpman on the boat in Sardinia for the World Cup down there. And, and uh, the Australian boats, they were really super fast. The Kookaburras, they, they were the best boats. And uh, we managed to end up fourth in that race, beating Dennis Conner, who was fifth. And he had just then uh, won the America's Cup in Australia the year before. Uh, 
So uh, anyway, that was nice to be tennis at that time anyway. The very last time I was on a 12 meter was in uh, 2010. We were a bunch of people going to Newport. We were about 30 in, in, the, in the group, you know, there was uh, the old crew, there were the sponsors, there were supporters of all kinds, but we were a nice guy, a gang of, of people going over there. We were lent a 12 meter to sail and uh, again had some races uh, with Dennis Connor, Ted Turner, and uh, Gordon Ingate, Australia, and a lot of, of good friends and competitors. So uh, that was the last time I was on the 12 meter. Now, uh, what's next? Uh, as you heard, uh, there's been a parameter bought by two guys in Göteborg, Lasse Mols uh, uh, and Hans Eliasson, uh, Northern Light. It's now uh, in a boatyard, it's just back in Sweden, on a boatyard in Orest, Vindervarvet, to be restored. They're not quite sure about uh, how much work there is, but they doubt they will be able to come up here for the 12 meter races this summer. They are hopeful that maybe they can do a race in Copenhagen in September. But I have a, a, a lot of pictures. I just got some new pictures of the shape of the boat that you might take a look at if you want to. Uh, a sensation or whatever I would say it is, but it's it's a revival of, of uh, the six meter class. It's really a growing interest in the class. It's much due to uh, a group down in Portugal, Spain, and it's uh, depending quite a bit on the old uh, royal, the, the old king, Juan Carlos in Spain, who's interested and in, he's sailing 12 meter. And that group, they had been thinking back and forth a lot of time. We, we should buy, we should build new boats and what should we build? And they have found out that uh, looking at the results through the years that the boats I designed in the mid eighties uh, had been the most, uh, been the boats that winning most of the World Cups through the years. So we better choose a pellet design. So that discussion, it's not quite over yet, but the thing is, uh, just this week, I, I ended a deal with a boat builder in Dubai who, is, who I sent my drawings to, and he's now starting to build two new six meters. <laughs> and I don't know if I mentioned it, uh, all my good Finnish friends. I had Fred Ashton, Rob Zachariasen, Thelen, Sundman, Hackman, another Talberg, and Root. Yeah, there were many others. It's been so nice to knowing all of you, and I like Finland quite a lot. Thank you. I have a couple of questions for you. you go ahead. My, uh, yes, I, yes. Uh, uh, Pella, thank you very, very, very much for coming. And, and if, at least to me, it was a huge honor to listen to you and meet you. And uh, from this size for me, you have been one of my legends and my heroes. So thank you very much. I, I had um, one question, but there's no easy or short answer, but maybe you would like to at least think about it. One of the discussions we always have in the meter boats is how far can you modify a boat? And, you know, can I, you know, modify the bow, the transom, can I change her underwater ship? And really, at what point does it stop to be a Pella Peterson design? And I discussed the same thing with Olin Stevens when he was still around, and there's no simple answer, but I think an interesting angle for everyone to think about is let's take the P1800 Volvo. Um, 
If I would change the rooftop on that car and I would put a V6 Mercedes-Benz engine in and um, I would lower her and, uh, you know, put black windows in, whatever, would that still be a B1800? And I think one of the, the, so the core question that I would like to ask, you know, which, which of your boats would you already consider cultural heritage and, you know, how much can we change to, and, and ensure that it still remains your design? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, uh, difficult question. When it comes to the meter boats, meter rule, I would say that there are two things about it. You know, the one thing what's happening below the waterline, and it's a heavy boat. It's a matter of distri distributing the volume, you know, in a way that that's uh, good for the lines of the boat, and then above the water line, it's more a matter of getting the sailing length, you know, when you heel the boat and the boat is moving. So uh, I think, uh, well, my solution has been uh, distributing the displacement the right way, which is tricky, you know, to get that much volume into there to carry this weight that the boat has. Well, the, uh, for what it's worth, your answer was almost 100 the same as all of Stevens. So, <laughs> and I think he would he would he would add the weight and weight distribution was key, and for the rest, it was exactly the same as you said. Yeah. Oh. But that's just I'm two two it. two legends giving an answer to the question and the same answers. Right. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah.